thank you guys for coming. Uh, I am uh, hosting John, John Later, and myself's postdoc. Uh, he's been here for, I guess, two, almost two years now. Uh, yeah, one and a half years. Uh, and he is doing a lot of numerical modeling of Mobile Bay. Uh, and he came to us from the University of Maine. Uh, and where he actually worked on looking at uh, hydrodynamics through uh, an oyster farm. Uh, and actually the oyster farm that we worked on, guys. Uh, <laughs> that, uh, uh, and so he's shifted gears and just focused more on uh, an estuary dynamics without any um, uh, aquaculture in it. And uh, his work is focused on, on modeling in Mobile Bay. And so today uh, he's going to talk to us about um, mixing and some of the dynamics during sort of non-extreme wind conditions in Mobile Bay. So, John, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, okay Brian. Hello, everyone. Uh, <clears throat> my name is John, uh, postdoc with Brian uh, and John later. So, uh, it's my second time to give a seminar. The, the, the first, first time we talked about, uh, I talked about my pretty work and uh, premise the last year to to present new stuff this year. So yeah, it's time for me to report the progress we made uh, during the PV period, uh, post -op period. So today we talk about the wind impacts on the uh, stratification and hypoxia in Mobile Bay. And uh, and uh, <clears throat> Mobile Bay is a river dominant shallow estuary, so it connects the Mobile Tensor River Delta to the Gulf of Mexico. So the uh, annual average discharge, river discharge, is uh, about 1,500 cubic meters per second. But this was very large seasonal variation. Uh, in early, early spring, the peak river discharge averaged to 10,000 cubic meters per second. But in the dry season, in summer, the river discharge dropped below uh, 500 cubic meters per second. And uh, uh, the Mobile Bay had very had a flat bottom, right? The average depth is only three meters. The deepest, uh, deepest part located in the shipping channel, which is more than 15 meters deep, as shown in the map. And uh, also, uh, there's a, a intracoastal waterway across the lower part of the Mobile Bay. So the bay connects uh, to the Gulf through the when pass had the inlet and indirectly uh, the river Mississippi Sound. The, the, the tide in the Gulf Coast is very weak. Uh, so the, uh, the maximum tide will range is 0.8 meters, and sometimes it just drops to zero. It's no tide. The, so, uh, yeah, so the mobile bay is also a eutrophic and a hypoxia estuary. So the water shade from uh, the organic matter from the water shade called hypoxia and uh, induce the famous jubilee events right, along, the, along the shorelines. The jubilee is where the water gets so uh, the oxygen go, go out so the, the all the sea, the fish and the crabs escape on, on the shallow through the shallow area to make it again safer. And also the uh, Previous study uh, from Jack Cook and Brian's previous PhD about that the stratification also has important role in the hypoxia. The, so the long term goal of the project is to study the climate if changing effects on the physics and the biochemistry in Mobile Bay. So it had been predicted that by the late 21st century, yeah, uh, the Air temperature in the Gulf of Mexico will increase at least two degrees. And uh, as shown by this map, over the hatch areas, the confidence is uh, about air temperature increase about 75%. So yeah, we make certain that the air temperature will increase in the future. And also the sea level rise, uh, sea level will rise about 0.61 meter by a uh, year to some 100. The, the change of precipitation is still unknown. And uh, also, uh, study from Jeff Cook finds the uh, flow of oxygen in Mobile Bay is decreasing since the uh, uh, last almost 20 years based on our data. So, this plot shows the, the gap 
between the observed the saturation the, of the oxygen and the observed the data. That means this slide is the survey increasing means that more oxygen is being utilized in mobile bay. So uh, therefore, before we predicting the future, we need to understand the present. Uh, firstly, so today uh, I will just focus on the, the present scenarios. And uh, I promise maybe next seminar we'll report some climate change stuff. Yeah, to be continued. And uh, so we, in our study, we built up a high resolution 3 dimensional uh, model for the mobile bay using the regional uh, ocean model system. Rubs. So in the model, we uh, cover the river delta and uh, the entire mobile bay, part of the Mississippi Sound, and uh, certain coastal waters. So in the model, we use very high resolution potential data from NOAA and, uh, and uh, uh, some latest survey data to map, map in the shipping channels because yeah, it's very important in our system. All the realistic forces are considered in the model uh, to mimic the real uh, case. So the you know, the tide, a little bit discharge, the kind of forcing like the heat flux, wind, precipitation. So and all the boundary conditions for the temperature salinity and the uh, uh, velocity and the water level are from a bigger domain model, a Dungas model, but we have their model has less uh, resolution, cannot do that model So so in the model because the shipping ch channel is very narrow to resolve the shipping channel we utilize a gradual uh, resize varies from 70 meters to 100 meters we vertically we apply 16 layers uh, to resolve the stratification and uh, since the, the delta area has a uh, flooding storage so to consider that effects we turn on the wet dry uh, option in the model all these set up allows us having a maximum time step with three seconds, uh, very simple, yeah. So the admissions uh, done with the model, the model readouts. So the left panel is the bottom of uh, uh, the evolution with respect, with respect to time. So uh, clearly we see the sort, right? The red color, the, the, the yellow color means the sort, the salty water through the, going to the system through the shipping channel, right? Can reach to, like right, mobile, right, city. And uh, also, the, the salt can also spread laterally to Bosport Bay through the very the intracoastal waterway. You can see the salt from here. So, uh, we did some, have some, to compare with some observation. So, you see that the model can capture, will capture the, uh, kind of the daily salt water pose uh, at Dolphin Island. Right at the main pass. So, as shown by this uh, red line, it's our model readout. So, the circles are the vision. So, at high, push the thought in uh, and out, back and forth at, at the inland. And also, the, uh, the, the animations on the, the right part shows the thought pattern illustration right in the shipping channel. So, the, here is the mouth, the tidal inlet. And the, this thing is uh, the river, uh, mobile river. So clearly we can see the, the sword penetrated from the bottom and we have fresh water um, at the surface in the upper color. So and during the high tide, we cause mixing, right? I see mixing, yeah, at the, the amount. Yeah. And uh, then the fresh water uh, will push, uh, now we can see the fresh water will push the front, yeah, further downstream. Another uh, fresh water hose is coming. So now the front will push right down, further downstream. Now, uh, we also compare the salinity and the temperature uh, with the upwards observation data at the mouth of stations, uh, driven by this map. So all the uh, black lines are the observation data, so the red lines are our model readout. So we can clearly see that the model had a good, very good performance. Yeah, then we can use that model to do our uh, other analysis. So before going into the analysis, I would like to introduce some very fundamental concepts in the X-ray dynamics. So an X-ray is where the fresh water meets the salty water and mix uh, each other. 
So, uh, so in astrophysics, we usually study two concepts: the flow and the soil. If we measure, take a for, measure the velocity profile vertically in the asteroid by removing the tidal component, we always achieve a, a typical, this kind of structure. Uh, the surface flow is always in the seaward direction, like going to the ocean, while there is a bottom return flow to the landward. It's the typical uh, structure. We call it asteroid situation. That's the, the flow. Then, uh, meanwhile, we can also measure the salinity profile. And uh, because the surface is a pressure, so the surface salinity is always less than the bottom salinity. So, this salinity difference will cause a density difference. And we name the density difference by stratification. So, and uh, clearly you can see the larger, right, top to bottom uh, salinity difference corresponding to the stronger uh, density difference, stronger stratification. There are multiple ways to measure the stratification. So uh, one way is one method is called the salinity variance. It is the total square deviation uh, of the salinity profile from the depth average back. And uh, of course, right, the larger uh, larger top to bottom difference corresponding to higher salinity variance and a stronger stronger stratification. So. So at the asteroids, the dominant forcing can have the, uh, from the river and the tide as well as the wind. In Mobile Bay, the tide is very big and they have very shallow damage. So the wind has a, an important effect. And the wind effect can have three aspects. Uh, one is called wind stress, depending on the wind's direction. Purely, uh, typically, the down asteroid wind will enhance the surface flow right to the toward the ocean and enhance the uh, circulation. While the up asteroid wind will block the surface flow and meanwhile will block the bottom flow and uh, weaken the circulation. And uh, the wind itself more like a forcing on the surface. So it, it will cause the surface turbulence and mixing. And uh, so it's from minus times wind, right? We have, uh, no matter what wind blowing, direction that so all can have surface uh, turbulence. The other effect, all the first two aspects are the local wind. So for asteroids, the remote wind on the shell can also affect asteroid dynamics. The uh, on the shell, like the in the northern hemisphere, the uh, east east wind always pump water to the north, coming in our wind direction, and the water goes to 90 degrees perpendicular to the wind direction. We call this Ekman transport. And uh, of course, if there is a Ekman transport on the shelf, then the flow can be further pushed into the asteroids. This is the uh, wind effect. And the Ekman tra transport on the shelf, we, really, we also call it the, like, the shelf down welding or the up welding uh, units. So today we will see how these three aspects affect the uh, stratification in mobile bay. So the in the from the spring to the fall, the wind patterns are the wind are dominated by the southeast wind uh, and also southwest wind, the wind from the southeast and southwest. While well, further checking the, the the wind speed, you see we can see that during the higher, stronger wind from the southeast, right by the by this uh, road map. Uh, and then we to clearly show the patterns, we picked up uh, southeast wind in May 2019. Uh, the, uh, the, the, the wind duration is about three, almost three, meters, three days, and the peak wind speed is uh, at eight meters per second. Uh, so the, the, black, the red line is the northward component, the black line is the uh, east west component, it's negative to, make, to, the, to, the, left, to the west. So we have multiple snapshots of the strat uh, stratification without wind from early wind, the peak wind, and after wind. So the without wind, the yellow color denotes the strong stratification. But we have a strong stratification in the lower bay, and the light blue means the less, uh, the weak stratification. Well, after the wind, we can see the 
all the yellow color is gone, so we don't have strong stratification. By the way, there is some part of the way that remains quick stratified, right? So don't divide the light uh, blue color. Yeah, so the overall we can see the wind reduces stratification, but why why we see this spatial heterogeneity? Some part is well mixed, right? Without stratification, but some part remains stratified. To answer to uh, understand this response, we further examine the uh, the terms in the salinity uh, various. So typically there are four terms. Uh, the uh, left term tendency is the local change by increase or decrease of circulation. And the term on the right hand side uh, corresponding to the uh, direction, you know, the transport of your uh, stratified water column, just transport water bottle. The second term called the streaming. Uh, streaming means what it's more like if if the fresh water Goes above the denser water, the salty water, we have uh, stratification. Or the denser water, uh, salty water goes below the fresh water, we have this, we call it stratification, we call it streaming. Of course, if, if the surface flow is bottom in the opposite direction, right, you might make a uniform salinity profile, that's called, we call it the natural stream, right, you keep the profile more vertically uniform. The last term is uh, dissipation. Uh, it always destroys the stratification. So by comparing this, the magnitude of these terms, we are able to tell the dominant processes right, in the uh, response. The yeah, other one. So, uh, so here we show the, the distribution of each term uh, at peak wind speed. So the blue color means the decrease of stratification. Uh, yeah. So in a tennis term, we can see the all negative blue means the, the wind decreases the stratification in, in the bay, almost everywhere. And the, the election term is the transport. So clearly, they, they have a larger magnitude in the lower part. Right? I mean, the transport is dominant in the uh, lower bay. And then the straining. As I mentioned before, straining has a, a positive straining and a negative straining. So the red color means the positive straining. The lower part you can see it's either the fresh water goes through the salty water or the salty water goes below the fresh water. Uh, it's called positive spin. Well, in the mid bay, right, we can see all the red, the blue color means negative spin. So that means right, the fresh water and salty water are step to each other. Right? We have a uniform salinity profile. So, and the, the dissipation term is. Uh, is not very large in the uh, tidal inlet. That means they have strong mixing right over, over, over there. So now, if since the the, the net forcing is defined by the straining minus the, the dissipation, the mixing. So that means in the blue area is where uh, the mixing uh, the stratification will decrease, while the uh, red color over the left part of the bay. Uh, right here, mean that the mixing is too weak right, to mix the, the water or, the, the, or to overcome the streaming. So that's why we still have re re remaining stratification in the lower part of the bay and the, in the lower left part and lower right part of the bay. As we showed before, right after wind, you have these patterns because the, the mixing is too weak for the air. And then we, at different locations, we then the terms, we can identify the dominant processors, right? In the mid-bay, that's the negative training and there is the mixing that decreases stratification. Well, towards the mouse, in the lower part, the convection uh, also plays an important role. And, uh, and the, some part of the bay was uh, remains stratified because there are still positive stringing as shown by this red pattern uh, here. So that means uh, the, the the play one, the difference in the play by response is it is it, called by the difference in the dominant processors. So to further understand the transport and the streaming, so we, we examine the surf the subtitle velocity and salinity and the surface and the bottom. So the so left panel is the surface and the right panel is the bottom. As I mentioned before, the typical actual situation is the surface flow to go to the ocean, right? Uh, same word, surface flow, and the 
upward and downward bottom. However, and the southeast wind, you can see the surface flows to the north, and the bottom flows to the, the, to the south. That means the wind flips the circulation pattern. And uh, <clears throat> furthermore, we can see the, uh, uh, the bottom flow, right, will, we might push the bottom salty water downstream. Because the, 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 that's corresponding to the negative streaming, because the, the bottom the salty water will move uh, downward and uh, separate with the fresh water. So, uh, but over the left part of the bay, in the, the, the lower part of the bay, you can see a natural flow driven by to the left, and uh, that might blocks the, the, the fresh water from the, from the upstream. So, the fresh water was remained to the left. Part of the bay, and that's why this area was used to ratify because the fresh water accumulates over there. Right? So, you further get in the, the velocity, you can see there is some incoming flow through the inlet right here, both the surface and the bottom. So, the surface flow, right, will encompass hit the natural flow in, inside the bay, but the bottom flow transport the, the bottom salt to the right. Noted by the arrows, right? That means that's why we have uh, in the, the in the stress screening. So we have those, we can see the slot pushed to the right over here, in the lower part of it, and have the positive stream, the red color in the positive stream. And uh, so last is the uh, election. It's in the, the transport, the, the global transport of the stratified water. So clearly the stratification uh, transport was over the left, left part of the bay. That means the fresh water feeds the salty water over the left part of the bay, and then the, the total body was transferred out of the system through the tidal inlets. That's the entire progress uh, of the wind effects. So uh, it seems that the wind can change the, the, the uh, exchange, can change exchange right at the tidal inlet. So to confirm that, we compare the flow patterns at the mouth with and without wind. So this pattern, the pattern uh, here is without wind. It means that the red is the flow going into the bay through the mouth, flow is coming out of the bay. So we can see in the shallower part of the inlet, it almost comes out, and also in the, uh, the upper one column, we have outflow, but we have inflow right in the bottom. In the bottom, at the bottom, in the deeper part. However, when we have the, the southeast wind, right, it reduced right, the surface outflow, right, in the shallower part by half magnitude, right, too. And the, in the deep part of the channel, there is throughout the water column, we have an inflow, right, into the, into the, into the bay. And then the, the shallow water was pumped into the bay. And uh, this is Back to the Ekman transport, right? So this is the Gulf of Mexico and this is the coastline. So we, we have some the, the wind from the east and pump the water to the north. That's why we have the incoming flow at the mouth. And the incoming flow also changes the salt transport. Yeah. So uh, now let's check the mixing, the component of the mixing. The mixing is really coming uh, from the bottom region, streamed by the high. In. And uh, since in our case also include the wind, so the mixing comes from the tide and the wind. So we, for the tide mixing, we, there's a number, a sense number, to tell whether your uh, bottom mixing can kill your stratification. And uh, well, similarly for the wind, there's a better number uh, compared to wind stress with the uh, uh, straining, the stratification straining. And uh, then we, we can check the, uh, the components of the distribution of the tidal mixing and the wind mixing. So clearly for the wind mixing, all the red color is, is, means the red, red number, number is larger than one. That means that the wind can, itself can, can cause, uh, can overcome the certification. So we can see the, uh, in the lower, in the uh, mid bay, so we have very red units. While in the lower bay, and the wind has minor effect over here. And for the tide mixing, similarly, so in the uh, mid bay, you can see the tide uh, bottom friction has some effect. 
while in the lower part, right next of the shifting channel, we already have a, a, a zoom right, with higher bottom friction, right? So, but other areas, the bottom friction is too weak, right? So all blue color, very small. So since the RPS is a combination of both wind and tide, so we add the vector number and the, and the sense number, this means the total mixing from wind and tide. This dash line is the, the remaining stratification after the wind. So we can see very in the red area, so the water column gets well mixed, right? But both through the wind and the tide. But in the lower part of it, like here, both the wind and the tide is either big spinning is too weak. So wind uh, mix the entire water column. That's why you can see the, the, the white solid line quantitatively match the black dash line. So where we have remains straight by. So, and furthermore, we can split. So we can tell which uh, has more contribution to the mixing, either the tide or the bottom friction or the wind. So as shown by this uh, diagram, so this dash line is where is the uh, wind mixing and the tide mixing has the same uh, strength. And above this line means the bottom mixing dominates or has larger component, has a larger contribution. Is where it's over the lower part of the bay in this area. But below this line, it means the wind right, has a, a larger con contribution. Right? So we can see in the mid part of the bay, the wind has, is, the wind contributes the, to the, the mixing. So, yeah, so while in the shipping channel, right here in the middle, in the shipping channel and the intercoastal waterway, the, these two points are very small, also tide mixing and wind mixing. That means when the tide had not had no effect over there. So yeah. So finally, let's have a quick summary for the wind effects. So you can assume that the the southeast wind is more like ice wind, right? Like the north component. So uh, that the wind flips us, right? We have called the surface flow upstream and then the bottom flow downstream over this area. Right, in the mid part of the bay, they have a negative stream because the fresh water goes upstream and bottom water goes downstream. The significant fire gets uniform. Uh, and similar, uh, but, but the, the, the wind shifts the, the fresh water transport, right? The fresh water will accumulate over here. And then in the fresh water and always goes through the salty water, that may have a positive stream. That's why this part could be straight up. The shelf effect, right, down wherever you went, pumps water through the, the inlet of the surface bottom. So the bottom flow, right, goes into the bay and shifts to the right, and right, salty water to the right, and uh, made with the, the fresh water on the surface, right, called positive stream. Well, the surface flow come, comes in and hits, right, hits the, the lateral flow inside the bay, and then resulting in a very strong mixing, right, over this area. So finally, this part has been stratified and here stratified, and all these regions are well mixed. Yeah, that's the, uh, uh, the conclusion for this paper part. And uh, now, since the, uh, the, the, the hypoxia is also depends on the physics, right? Like the transport or the action and mixing. So we also further uh, study the connection of the wind effect distribution mixing to the hypoxia development in Mobile Bay. So the right, right panel is our observed hypoxia port from our field data. So to study the hypoxia, we have used the biochemical model. So this is uh, a model is developed by the based on the nitrogen cycle, nitrogen cycle. So uh, it has the uh, growth of the phytoplankton, zooplankton and the uh, respiration of the triters. Uh, so, there are the, so therefore we can have a burden for the oxygen. And uh, note that the, both the flow, mixing, and the biochemical process respiration and the production will affect the, the oxygen. So how can we split by the physical contribution with the biochemical contributions? Uh, yeah, that's our question. So here is some model comparison uh, with the field data. So I will help in the uh, on score and the top end, we have uh, stations to compare the data to the 
red line is our layout. Uh, the circles and squares are the population. And we also compare the surface carbon distribution and the bottom of the oil oxygen based on our survey. So usually we have a monthly survey in the bay. So the left panel is the surface uh, patterns of the coral bale. And the right panels are the uh, our survey data. So we can see the model captures some uh, algae balloons right, in the bay, lower part of the bay. And also the for the no oxygen, right, we see some uh, low oxygen zones in the model and it's corresponding to the our observed atoms for here. Right. Now let's check the wind effect. So uh, this animation shows the really charge the wind. So the still the focus on the same southeast wind in the in late 19. So the last panel is the hypoxia area. So we can see during the southeast wind, the hypoxia area shrinks from 100 cubic uh, square kilometers to almost zero, right? Shrink by this nice. The black line is the original data, the red line is the uh, one hour low pass temperature data. I mean, the red line without time, no tidal signals. And uh, it's, it's, that means very, pretty close, I mean, the tide has little effect, right? On the hypoxia uh, uh, extinction. So maybe the wind has a dominant role. So the lower animation shows the, uh, the, the monthly evolution in May 2019. So the arrows are shows the wind. So we can see in the southeast wind, right, the, the water was pumped into the bay, but the shell water is more electrotic, and that to decrease the chlorophyll nutrition in the bay. And the, the shell water was accumulated over the bounce core, right, right part of the bay here. And that's why this area has little uh, chlorophyll uh, during the uh, annual, uh, after the wind event. And uh, the last panel is the bottom without oxygen. So the, uh, we can see that the, uh, during the, start of the wind event, the hypoxia area shrinks while it also moves down, downstream. So, yeah, and the way, so now we can tell that. Uh, the wind is important, but back to that question: How can it? How can it beat? Yeah, the the the, the physical contribution and the wind can, and the biochemical contribution. So, for the idea from the slit variance, so we can define the vertical dissolved oxygen variance right, as same as before. So, but now for the the dissolved oxygen, the surface. So you know, always controlled by the saturation, right? Always to tend to a uh, very constant value. However, the biochemical group of respiration will decrease the bottom uh, below oxygen, right? And uh, so that, that, that's why that means if there's a hypoxia, so the low bottom below oxygen is corresponding to the high vertical vertical variance. So the right figure shows our field data. So the axis is the bottom without oxygen. Y axis is a square root of the new variance, just have the same unit. The they have the regression line tells us that tell us that when the bottom below oxygen decrease, we have a higher vertical variance for in the uh, oxygen, right? So the difference below is the different locations, the blue are in the shoulder blanks. The red are in the shipping channel. But it, clearly, you can see that the low oxygen is, uh, uh, bottom below oxygen is naturally created with the uh, variance. Uh, when after our, the our pattern, so we can have the, the, the binary terms or the new variance, right? So the most different part is the biochemical streaming. The biochemical streaming is called, we also call it the natural system regulator. That's the production of the, uh, oxygen. Minus the uh, uh, respiration in the water column and the sediment. Of course, if you if the next thing any less than zero, then the hypoxia can be developed. Then we have higher the uh, higher uh variance, uh given uh given variance. And uh, then again by comparing the method of each term, we can identify the dominant process. So. So uh, based on analysis, it seems that the sediment respiration uh, dominates the hypoxia development as shown by this 
and uh, large, the red areas are where the bottom respiration is the strongest, right? Showing over here. And uh, the, now the the physical screening, as I mentioned before, the transport of the <coughs> water, right, has little effect, right? See the bacteria is only one, right? Has little effect to the uh, hypoxia development. And the mixing always kills the hypoxia because it can pump the surface water to the bottom, right? Uh, we we oxygen the bottom uh, water uh, by the mixing. So now the total straining is uh, the net, net forcing is the total straining minus the uh, mixing term. So we can see over the, the blue area is where the mixing is very strong to, uh, to uh, re oxygen the bottom water. And we have still have, but in some part, the mixing is, is weak. Yeah. And uh, furthermore, we'll check the transport of the oxygen. So these two are the surface uh, flow and the surface oxygen. The blue can is the same as before because it's a control by the physics. But at, at the bottom, we can see the, the bottom flow right, will spread the hypoxia barrier further downstream. You can see. Uh, by these arrows here, the lower right way and the lower left way. That's the, uh, the stuff, the transport. So, and then further confirmed by the transport, right? In the transport term, the action term. So the action was the, the hypoxia area was moved downstream by the flow. So blue area means the, the decrease of hypoxia, uh, uh, decrease of uh, 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 it varies by the increase of oxygen. And here we decrease the oxygen. So that's a transport. So now we can tell that the, the wound, right, modify the circulation, shifts the hypothetical wound, and, uh, and also the mixing has, has some effect. Furthermore, let me check the, uh, at the mouth, right, shelf of sediment water also pumped into the bay and mixed with the hypoxic water. So it means the remote wind effect can also change the, the oxygen inside the bay. So now it's our conclusion. So in the micro tidal shallow asteroid like a mobile bay, so the local wind can modify the secretion of the mixing, change the transport of the sword and oxygen. And uh, the, the, the wind, southeast wind reduces the stratification and it disrupts the hypoxia development. The remote wind right cause the down valley and up valley will alter the baby shell uh, exchange and model. So finally, that means what in, in mobile bay, so the wind changes uh, both physical and the biochemical processes through both the local right, wind and as well as the remote wind. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, finally, I would like to thank the funding source from our research, 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 research program and the complete source from uh, XC. Yeah, thank you. So, are there any questions from the room? We have to repeat the question uh, because it's hard to hear. Um, I'm wondering about the effect of particularly resuspension in Mobile Bay of sediments and what effect that would have on, I guess, the oxygen balance because it, that would be linked to the wind and also resuspension of sediments has been shown to increase the respiration and decrease oxygen. We summarize that question. Okay. So uh, the question was, what are the impacts of resuspension on hypoxia during these wind events? Yeah. So very good question. So because the mobility is very shallow, so the bottom location is important. As, as shown in this panel, Right, the red color is the standard, red into the standard respiration. But why in, in this area, right? In the mouse, it, it's not red because the bottom definitely was restricted to the, to the water color. Yeah, actually, the, we captured this pattern over here. Yeah, but right over there shows the flow was, has a less velocity, the velocity is low, then the particles can accumulate those areas. Right. That's why we have a higher bottom respiration. And then uh, why, so in yeah, the- Inbox, of course, specifically. Yes, yeah. specifically. And that's why, usually the 
back to our observation. Here. That's why we see lots of hypoxia near the shores and less over the mouth because the, yeah. the mixing might be resistant in the dynamics. Yeah. Or, or another reason is that the flow over here is very large. It will export the sediments outside the system right, in those areas. Yeah, yeah. yeah I think we don't have a sediment transport module into this. this Model that's hard thing to do. Yeah, where was the fennel model developed? Yeah, where is the fennel model developed? It was developed for the Louisiana shelf okay. originally. Yeah, I, I, um, it, yes, there are some problems. John later has pointed out. You know, it, this is obviously done in conjunction with John to sort of lead on a lot yeah, of yeah. this. He sort of pointed out there are some aspects of the fennel model that don't work in Mobile Bay. Mobile um, Bay is weird though. <laughs> like, um, yeah, uh, do you want to speak to any of that? Yes. Uh, yeah. So the problem is the fatal model, we assume once the particle hit the bottom, it will immediately disappear. Yeah. And the problem is that if the oxygen rate might be overestimated, the oxidation can be below zero right, in the model. That's not realistic. But I mean, uh, uh, we have so, so many oxygen uh, consumption. The other problem is the we, in a model, we have a parameter called the sinking velocity. Then it controls how long your particle can hit the bottom. But in our system, the bay is very shallow, right? Three meters. But the channel is very deep. But if we use a constant value, it will hit the bay, but never goes to the channel. It's just outside, it will transport outside the system. Yeah, that's why we see this model has some issue. Yeah. So actually, the mission uh, uh, lawyer from Shared by Joy is that the sediment we could set the bottom and then we will be export, which transport into the bay, into the channel, because of the flow out of the channel. That means all the shell particles will be finally go to the shipping channel and go downstream. Yeah, so that's why in the model, we, we couldn't find the, say, the, the uh, hypoxia in the uh, shipping channel, you see in the observation, we have some uh, here, right, in the upper part, but in the model, you can see it because it's very deep over there. So, uh, in the model, the particle hasn't hit that point yet, right? but it will hit the shallow part earlier. That's the problem. Yeah. We're trying to use other models to improve the, 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 yeah, the our future work. Other questions from there? There's some questions online as well. So we'll get to those once we run our course here. Yeah. Okay, Ari, Deb, any physics questions over there? Did you did you say that you're currently studying how climate change is going to affect all of this? Uh yeah. So how how do you think that that's going to affect the bottom DL in the future? Okay. Oh, right. Yeah. Uh, so the question uh, from the room was, you know, the overall goal of, of some of this work uh, was stated to be looking at climate change impacts. And so the question is, do you have had any sort of uh, insight into what you think is going to be happening with climate change uh, on a box? That's a very good question. That's back to the, the climate change. Uh, the, now it's just primary gas. So the we think the air temperature increase will have dominant impact. Yeah, the higher temperature mm -hmm. will help uh, will enhance the biochemical process. You might uh, expect more like uh, algae blooms uh, mm -hmm. in the in the bay, and also this algae bloom might move further upstream because it's very in spring, right? The ocean above is warmer than the in the bay. So if the air temperature gets higher. Perhaps the every group will want for the group upstream. Okay. Yeah. So and also the right more frequent algae bloom will be more corresponding to the more uh, frequent uh, uh, hypoxia because the actually the respiration can also depend on temperature. Mm -hmm. Right. The chemical rate. Right? A higher temperature has higher uh, rate. Yeah. Perhaps we might have uh, more more happily events in the future. The sea level rise. Based on other paper, the study that the sea level rise perhaps will increase 
uh, an exchange, a flashing because then it will make the system thicker and uh, now uh, a thicker and then uh, increase the velocity. So that might move the particles accumulated soon further downstream. Sure. Right. It complete, right? The yeah. temperature might move the aggregate upstream by the by the flashing, the kilo rise might move the downstream. So we'll be interested in studying which one is the dominant mm -hmm. in the project. Yeah. Right. Right. And I think this is a really difficult question, right? Because that's just one aspect, right? Then yes. perhaps it gets windier, right? Windier, yeah. yeah. It gets windier, There's like 12 implications of higher air yeah. temperature alone. <laughs> yeah, right? There's, there, it's, it, it's hard to, you know, it's going to be hard to isolate one effect because, yeah, and what happens if we have more river discharge, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's just like all these things are interacting, right? And they may not be independent. So it's going to be, yeah. Futures. Cars model. model. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and also the other to be honest, this model is not good for the for long runs like techies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Now for the physics, you will take one day to see the one mouse. Like, <laughs> you will turn on the petrol, one day you can only see the yeah. yeah. What's the time yeah. step on the model? Like three <laughs> seconds. Three seconds. Yeah. Wow. Because we in the model we include the, the uh, delta. Oh, okay. Yeah. Situation by map, the data we have so many small squares. Yeah. Yeah. So, and the, especially at this higher discharge, right? The hot flow goes from the, we call it large velocity. Large velocity. To, without large velocity, we have to decrease the time step. Yeah. Three seconds is the maximum. We try our best. Wait, you can't <laughs> model for three decades about <laughs> <laughs> yeah. dynamics with the three second time yeah. step. Yeah, but uh, another. Oh no, the time stamp will be two minutes. Okay, oh wow. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, so, yeah. Boy, it's much. <laughs> yeah. So, but it's different because now we can do like what? Like, with, a two, with, a, with a two minute time stamp, you can do one day, one, one, one year. Yeah, one day, one year. Right? Yeah. So, you're, that's, now you're working. But that doesn't include biochemistry, right? That's just, <laughs> that's just the physics, right? So, yeah. yeah. You're going to need a bigger computer. Yeah, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Called the Orca. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, there's a couple questions online. The first one is uh, Have you looked at the location of wastewater treatment plants, the effects that has on hypoxia? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so uh, it was it, Have you looked at the location of wastewater treatment plants and their effects on hypoxia? Yeah. Okay, I think not yet. We uh, we haven't uh, considered that, but I will consider it in the future. I will change the nutrient loading, right? I think, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that would be like point source nutrient loading. Yeah, we're definitely not there. Yeah, no, yeah. <laughs> all all nutrient loading from the river, uh, from the uh, like the Alabama river. Come on, let's break it down. From the river. Yeah. We, we know uh, in the mix bay, so mix bay is usually. Uh, Purification yeah, in the mix bay, they have some from the source. Yeah. But the mix bay has a, well, another problem in the model. The mix bay has a very narrow inlet connect to the mobile bay. Perhaps in the model, we didn't very well capture that thick channel right here. So the exchange from the mix bay and the bond core could be underestimated in the model. So even if added a point source here, that only affects this area, will not have effect outside of it. So, uh, some other questions would be uh, one related to how long uh, the hypoxia approximately retained in the bay. Um, uh, so, we, as you presented, that hypoxia shrink, uh, shrinks within a week, um, 10 days. Um, I guess that's uh, not sure I completely understand that question. Um, I guess. In general, do you think this is typical uh, that how long the proxy will be retained in the bay? Or do you think this is not possible? Okay. Yeah, you know so, okay. yeah, I think um, very, I think it's a very nice question. One, one uh, uh, is, I think, depends on the average volume. So, in the ammunition, what we can see, uh, so it's very, the, uh, Average room has a uh, both spatial and uh, temporal variation a lot. Right. So the uh, as told by this event, 
the hypoxia is going to remain for almost 10 days and then shrink during the winning event. So, but in reality, by the, the tide, both the tide and the wind have a shorter time scale, like several days. Yeah. We think this short event, like the wind, will change the hypoxia zone and the, and the, and the uh, strength. Maybe not, not entire, not exactly swap up all the hypoxia, but it will reduce the, the area of hypoxia. So as, as you see here, this plot, the, the point at May, on May 5th, right? We also have some wind events over here, right? It's a northward, it's a, only the, it's the south wind from north, towards the north. We see a decrease of hypoxia area, right? As we will decrease by almost a half. So obviously all this short-term wind will change the, the stuff. And then we, perhaps in the model or some negative stuff, we can tell time scale, I mean, it's, it's what it's corresponding to the H square, the depth square over the eddy diffusivity. Yeah, so and in the system, in our system, maybe this time scale is uh, two to three days. Yeah. That means the wind can change the stuff in two to three days. So, the, uh, also, a sort of a related question would be um, Did you, you sort of answer this already, but I uh, can't hurt to sort of reiterate. Uh, so did you apply the extended depth of like 200 or 500 meters to your model to check the shrinking time of hypoxia? So you kind of answered this question to some extent when you were talking about sea level rise. What, uh, but, but feel this how we feel? Yeah, so this. Sort of, did you deepen the estuary or did we deepen the estuary? What do you think might happen? All right. So we hear the 200, 500 means the, the channel or the, the goal? It's not clear. Uh, yeah, it's not clear. Um, I, I would interpret this question as um, if you channel. yeah, if you extended the, if you made the, the system deeper, what do you think might happen? All right. Well, uh, <laughs> uh, well, if we make the system deeper, right? Uh, right, perhaps. Perhaps the the particle can be hard to see. I have got more sort time to bay. Time is right. Yeah. Or you know, it's just like that. Yeah. But but I'm sure in the in the in the you can the channel is very steady state. Yeah. Right? The tide wouldn't affect the deep, deep channel. Yeah, March, even now it's 50 meters, if you make it deeper, it's still very stable. The channel will be very stable. The soil has to be more time, yeah, longer time. Yeah, the hypoxia in the ship channel can have a longer duration. I don't know. Sure, so it's hard to see. And you mean the if you see the model domain to extend to a deeper area, or well, this one is hard. It's yeah, we focus on the bay. And the one we are developing we will uh, cover the whole Mississippi bite right? from this from Florida to the St. Joseph Bay, from from, from Mississippi to Florida. Right? You might have a larger domain and uh, and uh, consider the hypoxia on the shelf. The last question is, um, uh, it says, nice presentation, I have a general question. Do you have any suggestions for aquaculture, such as site selection and management? All right, good question. For the uh, oyster, for the aquaculture, you really need the oyster. So the oyster doesn't like fresh water. So based on this model, at least we can see the, the salt penetration. We can do a series of study covering uh, different scenarios, right? And uh, so perhaps we should uh, move the uh, farm in the lower, yeah, place the farm in the lower part, yeah, in the lower part. And uh, uh, if it's possible, we can also place the oyster farm away from this hypoxic zones, uh, right, right here. So uh, I, I would see. Based on this map, so the right, the lower part, the middle of the lower bay, this area can be a good choice for the aquaculture, right? It has salty water, right? That's fresh. And it also has maybe enough oxygen for the oxygen to survive, uh, or some part of it is good, yeah, for aquaculture activities. Thank you. Okay.
Uh, I think that has exhausted the uh, questions that we got online. I don't see any.